I do want to introduce him properly to you because he's had an extraordinarily rich and diverse career, a career I would describe as political come academic come political. Uh, and I'll briefly try and give you some of its, of its flavor <coughs> before handing over to Stuart. <coughs> After graduating um, from Oxford, Stuart came very quickly to the attention of Harold Wilson, who was then Labour's shadow uh, chancellor. Um, Wilson fairly swiftly after that became Prime Minister and it wasn't <coughs> long before Stuart was working not immediately directly for Wilson but for uh, Thomas Ballot, uh, who was one of Wilson's economic advisors in the Cabinet Office. But before long Stuart was in Downing Street itself uh, and working very closely with Wilson, uh, still then Stuart in his mid-twenties uh, on Britain's, Labour's then, uh, application to join the European <coughs> Economic uh, Community. And I think we'll hear a little bit more from Stuart of, of that phase in his life in a moment. But after a period in that position, Stuart uh, resigned and accepted a research fellowship at Sussex, where he began to work through uh, very original ideas about the potential for state uh, holding companies in the condition of capitalism uh, in the early 70s. He published from that position uh, a book called The State as Entrepreneur uh, in 1972. And this work was, I think, a, a really pioneering attempt to begin to think through the capacity for states to provide leadership in economic development in a national economy, indeed in a world and regional economy that was increasingly dominated by multinational capital. And so, of course, Stuart's ideas again drew the interest of, of the Labour Party. And after the February 74 election, and Labour was perhaps to a surprise pitched back into governmental office, Stuart became an advisor to Judith Hart, who was um, Wilson's Minister for Overseas Development. But he also began to become close to Tony Benn, who was preoccupied at the time with bringing in a new industry act. And Stuart worked with Tony on that. But he again resigned his advisory position and published in 1975 uh, a book called The Socialist Challenge, where he set out um, his developing ideas on what uh, governments, what national governments could and could not do to countervail the rising power of multinational corporations and multinational capital. And I personally still remember the excitement of, of, of reading that and playing it in my mind against the ideas of Tony Crossland, which had been the other formative book on my own uh, political or political economic development. By 1979, Stuart was back in politics again, uh, but in his own name, as it were, as MP for Vauxhall in, in South London, um, a position he held for a, a decade until uh, 1989, and in that period, um, the, the, the Thatcher years, the, the wilderness years for Labour as it were, he worked especially hard to build a European dimension to um, a putative Labour alternative economic strategy, and in doing so worked very closely, he collaborated extensively with people like Jack Delors, uh, Billy Brandt, Bruno Kreisky, and others in the Socialist International. Neil Kinnock made him Shadow Minister for International Cooperation in 1983, I think. Well, in 1989, as I said, Stuart resigned as, as MP for, uh, for, for Vauxhall uh, and took up an academic post again at the European University Institute in Florence, and he now holds the position of Professor of Economics at the University of, of Coimbra in, in Portugal, from which base he continues to fully engaged the debate about the future of the European Union, as we shall hear a little bit more tomorrow in the policy round table with which the conference ends. But for now, he's in um, reflective, reminiscent mode, uh, rather than, as it were, policy proposal uh, mode, and he'll speak to the, to the title that he has given us again, um, 
at Sarah's instruction uh, months to go. Can we have your title, please, Mr. Holland, in a normal fashion? And the title that uh, he or she, I don't know which, came up with was Brief <laughs> Encounters with Power, uh, Some Recollections and Some Reminiscences. Stuart. Thank you. Okay, so I've, uh, I've been encouraged, almost instructed, to be anecdotal. And my daughter, uh, whom I was with in Brighton uh, until this morning, said, oh, Dad, you'll have a great time. You enjoy nothing more than talking about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, behind is, I get to keep it anecdotal because this, these anecdotes we will not as yet find in any official record. In some cases, by the Foreign Office, they've been repressed. Uh, and for some of you, for some of you, the names will be very familiar. For others, not at all. So I shall try and explain who the people are as we go. The attorneys helped a lot. Um, I, I started... Uh, I started with history and political theory, then went to the States, and I wanted to decide whether I would do history and political theory at Oxford or I would do politics, philosophy, and economics. And I think, uh, I said in some of the side sessions, when I went to an economics course, I thought to myself, this is a private language game played between economists. It's where Wittgenstein and Russell were uh, in logical atomism, as if algebra could mirror reality, and where economics thereafter has been trapped. And uh, so I decided to, to do history uh, at Oxford, and I'm very, very glad I did, because life is too short only to be an economist. Uh, I then changed to economics, uh, almost, uh, well, in fact, quite unwillingly. But I wanted to do a politics uh, PhD on opposition parties in the then European community. All the opposition parties at that time were all on the left, as it happened. And I asked a very eminent development economist at Oxford if he'd let me read a paper on economic integration. And he said, yes. And then, when I'd read it, he said, I'm not going to let you leave the room. So I said, my god, was the paper really that bad? Uh, he said, no, the paper was really very good. And we talked a bit more, and I said, look, I don't want to do economics. Uh, you, you must change to economics. I said, I don't want to do that. I gave the same reasons as I'd just given to you. It's trapped in its own private language gate. He said, no, but that's why you must do it. And he persuaded me to, uh, he said, I'll have a word with John Hicks. Economists among you will know that Hicks was a fairly eminent economist. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Hicks will let you join his seminars, which I did. And then when I tore what's called the hoteling spatial duopoly model to shreds, uh, by going for its presuppositions and showing how unrealistic they were, Hicks really liked it. And actually, though I'd only been studying economics for a few weeks, uh, said to me after the seminar, I'd be really obliged if you would uh, comment on my draft for capital and growth. Well, this was all quite seductive. Uh, and <laughs> I had difficulties in the comments because capital and growth is just a comparison of different phases of static equilibrium. And so I said to him, he said, have you read it? And I said, yes, I've read it. Um, do you have any comments? I said, I think it would be really interesting if you could combine this with a Schumpeterian perspective, asymmetry, no equilibrium. I didn't add that. He knew what Schumpeter was about. He said, it would be difficult. It would, in fact, have, he didn't add this, but it would, in fact, have been impossible. But he was, I was very fortunate, because then I went and worked with Balog 
And I said to Balog, uh, look, I can't work with you for the next three months. I've got this examination, the first examination in economics coming up, a graduate degree, which at Oxford is called a B-Phil. Um, and he said, no, I need you. So I said, well, I, I, I really, I, I, I can't. I can't be full time. He said, well, leave that to me. And then I learned, of course, he rang Hicks. And he said, listen, Holland, I, I, I need you here. The Prime Minister needs him here. He doesn't have to do the B for the examination. Does he? Surely he can just go. He's got a, a dissertation in it. Surely he can go straight to a doctorate. And with immense self-confidence and generosity, Hicks said, yes. So I'm probably not only the only graduate in history at Oxford who has a DPhil in economics, I'm probably the only DPhil in economics at almost any university who has no prior degree in economics whatsoever. And that was due to the generosity of Hicks. Balog was not so generous. When he called me to work in the cabinet office, I had just been, he was first thrilled I had just uh, been in Paris, I'd been giving a seminar on regional development, which was my research area, and uh, somebody made, invited Michel Rocard and somebody less known called Pierre Jacques. Uh, Jacques happened to be the son, one of the two sons, of de Gaulle's interior minister. But I paid no attention to that at the time. Uh, and I, but Jacques said, he knew I was going to be working later that month, January 66, uh, as an advisor to Wilson through Bell. He said, uh, you must meet Jean Saint-Jour at the Ministry of Finance. So I said, fine. And I went and I met Saint-Jour, and uh, I'd just been reading, uh, I just bought a book by Francois Perrou. François Perrou, for those of you who do not know, is an economist of disequilibrium, a Schumpeterian. And I put, I put, I got the book in my hand, I put it on the table, and Saint-Jean said, ah, oh, you're interested in François Perrou. He said, you must be the only Englishman who is. Uh, it was not, in fact, quite true. There are at least six of us who were. Uh, but then, I, on the desk was a copy of the Fifth French Plan, which had just come out. And I said, ah, the fifth plan. So he said, yes. Why are you interested? I said, well, it's the first plan that's uh, been put to the French Parliament. We have, last year, published the national plan. That has been inspired by French planning. It would, uh, I'd be, oh, of course, you can have a copy. He said, but don't be too impressed. So I said, why not? He said, well, the plan says that we're going to invest in health, education, urban renewal. Uh, social security, new universities. So I said, well, that sounds rather good to me. He said, yes, but we have a president, a president de la République who wants plan calcul, force de frappe, arme nucléaire, TGV, Concorde 2. Uh, I said, well, alors qu'est-ce que vous prévoyez? He was director de la prévision. This was January 66. He said, franchement, je prévois de grave tension sociale. He didn't say May 68 at the Sorbonne. That is forecasting. That is serious forecasting. <laughs> and uh, so then I turned up in the cabinet office, and Balog, who was Balog, was, uh, Balog was one of the two Hungarian advisors to the government. He to the Prime Minister Wilson, and Nicholas Caldor, very famous economist, to the Chancellor. Um, Callum at the time. And so Tommy came into my room and slapped a document like this, about 33 pages, on my desk and said, rip that to shreds. So it had top secret in capital letters uh, at the top, and it was a document from the Foreign Office making the case for a second British application, because de Gaulle had vetoed the first British application. So I said, uh, yes, well, I'm sure I can. Um, then I started to read it, and it was simply dreadful. 
It was in the name of the Foreign Secretary, but it was already a neoliberal statement of the case for joining Europe. At the time, there wasn't a single economist in the Foreign Office, which may or may not have been to its disadvantage, but in principle, but proved to be so. Then, uh, at the end of the month, at 28th of January, de Gaulle gained the Luxembourg veto. That is to say, qualified majority voting, which could bind a nation state, was due to come into force in 1966. And as many of you will know, he played the empty chair policy. He pulled all his ministers out uh, in July uh, 1965 and ground the community to a halt. And uh, then another foreign office paper was passed to me, and it essentially said, uh, this is absolutely useless. We have to accept qualified majority voting, otherwise we won't get the support of the five. And uh, we have, you know, it actually said, uh, we've just got to wait until de Gaulle either resigns, retires, or drops dead. And so I wrote a paper, I mean, trained in the Oxbridge tradition, to say, one says what one thinks. So I said, the Foreign Office, as usual, has got this entirely back to front. The Westminster will never accept qualified majority voting to be overruled. If it does, there will be serious political consequences. And uh, <coughs> then also I made the case that we should propose, if, he, if Wilson wanted to apply to join the European community, we should propose a European technology community in which there will be joint co-financing by us and other member states of the kind of advanced te technology project that de Gaulle wanted. Germany didn't have many of these advanced technology projects, because one I didn't mention uh, was Ariane, rocketry. After World War II, though having been highly successful with it during it, Germany renounced rocketry. Uh, Germany renounced also to develop nuclear weapons. And uh, the, so I proposed we should have a European technology community. That then became public knowledge uh, some months later because very shortly after, uh, uh, then in March, in March 1966, Robert Marshall, who had been the deputy to uh, Monet at the French plan, people forget that Monet was a planner. He was a rather tough planner in uh, reconstruction after the war. Um, Robert Marjolin, who'd been the Secretary General of OEC, very young, the, the Marshall Aid Program, in his 30s, had become the Senior Vice President of the Commission and wanted to get French-style indicative planning adopted at a European level. I got to know him rather well, and I later said to him, how did you justify that in terms of the Rome Treaty? He said, it was hell. It was hell. I put one of my best people into work, working through the Rome Treaty to try and find anything on which we could hang it. We couldn't accept our, what then was Article 2, rising standards of living, greater cooperation, etc., etc. The Marshaller Medium Term Economic Policy Committee, he also was very astute because he chose not to chair it himself and he did not allow the Commission to chair it. He invited Lala who was the German Under Secretary of State for the Economy to chair it, and Langer was the junior minister to Erhardt, who, of course, was an architect of, or endorser of, Sozial Marktwirtschaft, not just an internal market. <coughs> so anyway, I wrote this, uh, this paper, which Ballard passed to Wilson, saying, since Marjola has succeeded in getting support for this, it's quite clear that our membership of the common market is compatible with planning, medium-term planning. And that first report of March 66 followed that of the Spark report, which was of, of 50, 56, 10 years before, which was not reflected in the Rome Treaty at all. 
that the free working market ag mechanism can aggravate structural, social, and regional policies. Therefore, if there were to be a common market, it would need structural, social, uh, could aggravate structural, social, and regional disparities. Therefore, if there were to be a common market, it would need positive integration through structural, social, and regional policies. Then we had the July 66 measures and uh, a deflationary package forced by speculation against uh, Sterling. So Wilson became even more interested in this and went to cabinet and said to George Brown, who was foreign secretary after the deflationary package, George, I'm sure he, he pronounced it abominably. Uh, but George, what do you think of uh, Robert Marjola's premier politique de économique à moyen terme? Yes? So he must have pronounced it in the Yorkshire accent because Harold's French was not very good. Brown stormed back to the Foreign Office and said, I, I have only indirect indications of this from the bottom of the line. Stormed back to the Foreign Office and said, What this damn effing French effing document which Wilson raised with me in cabinet. And what I'm about to say relates to, for political theorists to Weberian hierarchy. Because the permanent secretary, a man called Sir Paul Gorbouz, whose favorite pastime was dressing up as Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> turned to the deputy secretary, the well-named Sir Con O'Neill, who'd led the first application, which had failed, who turned to the undersecretary, who turned to the assistant secretary, who turned to the principal, who turned to the assistant principal, and said, find out about this damn planning document. So I got a call at the cabinet office from the assistant principal, who said, look, old boy, we were both probably 26 at the time. <laughs> Look, old boy, I, I, this document which uh, the Prime Minister raised in Cabinet with the Foreign Secretary has caused quite a stir. And I've been asked to find out uh, what it is and to report on it. Uh, could you tell me its title? So I gave him the title. A couple of days later. Uh, look, old boy, uh, we've checked with our delegation in Brussels and they'd never heard of it. Are you sure it really exists? So I said, yes, I'm sure it really exists. Would you mind telling me how you know it exists? I said, because I read Le Monde. And Le Monde devoted its first, second, and half of its third page to it on such and such a date. Oh, he said. Uh, would you mind telling me how you got a copy of it? I said, yes. I got it from the European Communities Information Office in London. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Then I get another call. Uh, look, old boy, uh, there's a slight problem here because apparently they only had two copies and they've sent the second to a Midlands engineering firm. Making uh, <laughs> a mistake. Uh, would you mind letting me have a copy? So I said no, uh, but it was about 220 pages long. I went and photocopied it on the photocopying machines in number 10. Later, MI5, who didn't want to give me security clearance, and thought that they thought that Wilson, I didn't realize at the time, they thought that Wilson was a Russian spy. <laughs> and they wouldn't give me security clearance because they said, well, how do we know? You've come from nowhere. You know, I'm from nowhere. And uh, suddenly, you're a right-hand man of the prime minister. So, and one of the allegations made against me was I spent too much time on the goddamn photocopying machine downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, let, I let the hapless assistant principal uh, know, I sent, I sent it to him, uh, sent him the document, then he called me again and said, look old boy, uh, could we have lunch? So, of course, I'm a courteous person. And I said, yes. He said, look, I've really got a problem here. 
uh, you see, I, I've been in, in Persia, and my Farsi is, is, ri is really quite hot. But I haven't read French since I did O-Levels. O-Levels is an examination one does in, in Britain about the age of 15, 16. And he said, the whole of this document is in French. And it's all about economics and economic planning. And I haven't any economics, and I don't know anything about planning. Uh, could you kindly let me have, I've got to make a report for the Foreign Secretary. Could you kindly let me have a copy of your memo to the Prime Minister? So I said, well, you know, I think a plurality of views is really important to the government. Uh, I'd have been skinned alive if I'd uh, let him have a copy of it. Then he went to a meeting of deputy secretaries. That, at the time, they changed all the titles, but that deputy secretary was the second senior official in any department. A committee of deputy secretaries, which Wilson had set up, because I had made the case that we should apply on the basis of accepting the Luxembourg veto, and Marjolaine's case for medium-term economic planning. And there was Sir Con O'Neill. And the chair of the committee was a private secretary whom Wilson had moved sideways, because when he was first going to the States and wanted to take his political secretary, Marcia Williams, with him, Derek Mitchell had said, I'm afraid, Prime Minister, uh, that's not going to be possible. And Wilson said, why not? He said, uh, well, there's no provision for it. Unless, of course, she would like to come as your maid. Uh, <laughs> see, the civil service then was very, very powerful. The later, I, I, I'm really going to run out of time if I carry on with these kinds of details, but I think there is some interest in this. Under the Blair government, and to some extent under Thatcher, special advisors became hegemonic. But at the time, the, the civil service was hegemonic, and it was incompetent. And uh, so anyway, Derek Mitchell, knowing uh, the background on, what, on which I briefed Wilson, said to Con O'Neill, so uh, <laughs> Con, what do you think of the proposal of Mr. Holland that uh, the marginal and medium-term economic policy committee is entirely compatible with the national plan? And Sir Con O'Neill said, we have considered Mr. Holland's arguments in detail and concluded that there is no foundation whatever for them. This was immediately after I'd come from the lunch at which the Foreign Office official had said, look, old boy, this document's 220 pages in French. I haven't read French since O level. It's in economics. Could I please have a copy of the memo to the Prime Minister? Con O'Neill lied. And uh, Wilson, of course, enjoyed this. And later wanted to make me the first economic advisor to the Foreign Office. When Paul Gorbuz and Con O'Neill got their revenge. Because they came to number 10 and said, if he is appointed, we resign. Now, I learned of this later through Marcy Williams. And, of course, it shook me. You know, it, we had a majority of nearly 100 by then. And uh, Wilson, Wilson, of course, a very intelligent man. I mean, what he really should have said was, uh, could, you, could you remind me how many A-class a administrative civil servants, i.e. Top, top qualified people you had in the Foreign Office? Hmm. 4,000, 4,500? Are you really suggesting that the appointment of one 27-year-old is going to cripple the Foreign Office? My dear sirs, if that's really your view, then I probably should have your resignations on my desk tomorrow morning. Goodbye. Well, that would have put them on the spot, but he climbed down. And Wilson nearly always climbed down when he was challenged. Um, then the European Technology Community Project just went into stasis. But Wilson was in trouble because there were four or five cabinet ministers, including Roy Jenkins, Michael Stewart, and others, 
who could have resigned, they were threatening to resign if he did not apply to join the then European Union. On the other hand, he felt trapped because the left didn't want the common market. And uh, I fell out with Balk because I was making the case that we could have an alternative Europe which would not be supranational, would not be neoliberal, because a technology community would be planned. You can't do an advanced technology project without planning it. And then there was the medium term planning, economic planning committee of Marginal. And uh, so he wasn't forwarding any, anything I was writing to Wilson. But then one day, Wilson came and was in the cabinet office for some other reason probably a cabinet subcommittee of ministers, because number 10 in the cabinet room is large. But there aren't any other really large rooms. So he stuck his head around my door, and he said, Stuart, I haven't, I haven't heard anything from you for three, three, four weeks. What's happened? Have you fallen out with Tommy? And I took a millisecond decision, and uh, said, yes. Why? He said. So I gave the reasons in less than a minute, a few seconds. He said, yes, well, you, you better come around and talk to me about this in number 10 this evening. Uh, so I said, uh, fine, uh, where? He said, in the flat. So I turn up after number 10 and uh, taken by Wilson up to the flat. And he said, run through the case for me again. And so I ran through the case for him again. And uh, he said, if only I could get this through to the goal. So I said, what's the ambassador doing? Oh, the ambassador's insulted the girl, or the girl thinks he's insulted him. So I said, change the ambassador. He said, that's all very well, but George wouldn't stand for it, George Brown, the foreign minister. So I said, do you want me to get through to the girl? So he laughed. He'd already offered me, uh, well, he, he, he laughed and he said, Stuart, you're a clever lad, but are you really telling me how uh, you can get through to the girl? So I said, yes, I think I can. So he said, would you mind telling me how? So here's the prime minister asking me if I'd be courteous enough to tell him how I'd managed to pull off a feat on which the foreign office had failed. He said, no, before you do this, it's too important. He said, uh, will you have a scotch? So I said, yes, thank you very much. So he said, a malt? I said, yes, why not? But uh, I immediately had some doubts about Harold because whereas I'd like a malt to fill at least something of a glass this size, he gave me a thimble <laughs> and uh, I swallowed it at once and he said uh, would, yeah, run, run me through this again so I said well my best friend and contact in France is Pierre Jacques, who's the son of Louis Jacques who was the girl's right-hand man was the chief negotiator in NATO. He said, and he cut in immediately. He said, I know who Jacques is. How's your French? So I said, je pense que je suis bien, bien capable de m'exprimer en français, etc., etc. He said, how's your pronunciation so good? <laughs> so I, I said that his wife already happened to know him. I used to sing. And uh, I said, you can't sing forêt and pronounce it like Edward Heath. <laughs> and expect audience applause. <laughs> so he then said, can you pay your own fare? <laughs> I thought, oh my God. My God, here I am, potentially making a major diplomatic opening, and I'm going to have to do it on my student overdraft. <laughs> so, but I immediately realized this needed deniability. Not just the deniability that would not have been possible had he got me some official funding. But also, if I failed, it would be important that he could, uh, could deny that he'd ever paid for it. Also, it would have offended the whole Foreign Office, which, of course, later it did. <laughs> so he said, how can, soon can you set it up? I said, I'll, uh, I'll ring Pierre. Uh, and uh, so I rang Pierre, not on my home line, because when I moved into number 10, 
George Wigg happened to be paranoid about security at the time. He said, you must see the security people, etc. And they said, do you have a telephone? And I just moved into a new, new flat. And I said, no. Are you going home for lunch? I said, yes. We'll fit you a phone. I could hardly have a clearer warning <laughs> that somebody's going to be listening to the goddamn phone. So I didn't ring on my own phone. I rang on another phone. And I got through to Pierre. And I said, um, I'd like to see your dad. Uh, you, uh, he said, is the basis personal or professional? I said, it's professional. Is it needed soon? I said, yes, soon. So he said, I'll ring you back. And Louis Jacques agreed to see me the following Friday. This was about eight days, eight, nine days time. Wilson, delighted, announced on the Monday he was applying, making the second British application. De Gaulle on the Tuesday held a press conference and gave six reasons why it would not succeed. <laughs> so it was against this auspicious background <laughs> that I flew to Paris at my own expense <laughs> to see Louis Jacques on the Friday. And my bank manager went berserk because he said the following week, he said, we had a carefully agreed overdraft limit, and then I see that you've just gone off to Paris for the weekend. Uh, difficult. When I got there, I, uh, I saw Louis in the Ministry of the Interior. It was official in the sense that he was the minister, but it was one-to-one. -one. And uh, he was very good. If any of you remember the, the film star Jean Gabin, he was rather like Jean Gabin. But if you don't remember Jean Gabin, uh, you might have seen the film The Day of the Jackal, because the interior minister in The Day of the Jackal was Louis Jacques. Um, so he put me at, at my ease and said, uh, listen, Pierre has told me uh, about you, and so on and so forth, and uh, you run through the case, and I won't interrupt you unless I don't actually understand. And then we can discuss it. So I took the six points which to go to be. And uh, the first I said is the second application will be on the basis of accepting the Luxembourg veto. That was really new. Second, I explained what we had in mind by European technology community. And that the de facto axis would be Franco-British because Germany had issued all these advanced technology weapons, etc., advanced technology rocketry, and so forth, after the war. Thirdly, that uh, we would offer joint currency support. That is to say, for the franc zone and the sterling zone. If either were threatened, then the other would support it. And two or three other reasons. Then Louis said, but first there must be a denial of the special relationship, i.e. with the US. Now, I knew this was going to come up, but sometimes, often in life, including public life, you think of just the right words at the wrong time, after the event. But it came to me to say, la logique est implicite. The logic is implicit. We have, uh, and I said, ça nie aussi le, le bon sens. Uh, refuser une liaison particulière sans savoir s'il existe réellement une alternative ni le bon sens. But I think I've also said, dans la politique comme dans l'amour. Yes, in, in politics as in love to deny a particular relationship before you have another that you know is really going to work <laughs> defies good sense. And he smiled. And then he said, but the, uh, well, then he said various other things. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you one of them now. He said, but if there is a technology community, il faut préciser les projets en avance. You, we, you've got to specify the project with us in advance. Not necessarily publicly, it can be just a protocol. I said, that's fine, that's clear, that's understood. Uh, 
Then I expected him to say, Mr. Holland has really been very interesting. Uh, we are so grateful to have the chance for these discussions. And of course, I shall report to the President of the Republic, and we will, in due course, be in touch with him. I expected no more. What he said was, this has been really important. We had no idea that a technology community could be along these lines. We had no idea that the British application could support the Luxembourg veto. Clearly that is important because that will be in the protocol of accession, which also thereby, thereby would change the treaties. And would mean we would have a, con he didn't know this, but it would mean we'd have a confederal, not a supranational Europe. So anyway, he said it's really important, etc., etc., etc. The President of the Republic is waiting for me in the Elysee for a report on our meeting. And I am going to him immediately with a report which will be positive. Now, I was staying. The, the Jacques's were um, an old Huguenot family and uh, had been a merchant family, and they had a wonderful house, still have, on the Ile de la Cité. Uh, unfortunately, just opposite Samaritan, so you've got uh, uh, a lot of neon light across the river. But there you are, it's a wonderful old house. And uh, Louis and his wife were on floors one and two, and Pierre and his then wife uh, were on floors three and four. So I was staying uh, in the Jacques, Maison Jacques, and uh, I got a message in the morning. Louis would like to see you, so I go, go down a few stairs. And he said, the answer is yes. Mais, of course, yes, but. Mais, il faut préciser les projets en avance. And Draw, let us draw up an agreement of what has been agreed with Pierre, who was then already a civil servant, later a very senior <coughs> socialist minister. He did not say there has to be an open renunciation of the special relationship. So naturally, I was quite pleased. And uh, I rang Marcia Williams, who'd asked me to, to ring, to let Harold know, etc. And uh, she said, how did it go? So I said, he said, yes. She said, what? I said, he said, yes. Yes, but, but the but is not so important. I mean, he is him. I said, yes, it's him. And I'll report to Harold when I get back. So I reported to Harold, and I made claim, claim that a successful application had to be on the basis of accepting the Luxembourg veto, and on at least a, a protocol outlining the project, which even could be provisional, but outlining the series. Now, Wilson then made a reply. Some people are a bit surprised that and when I finally re resigned from number 10, uh, which was later, some people were surprised especially since he offered to make me head of what would be the first policy unit in number two. But the answer he gave when I saw him shocked me. The, he said, this is excellent. That didn't shock me. The girl is now a puppet on the string. That was the lyric, a lyric at the time. I'm a puppet on the string, etc., etc. I was taken aback. The girl was nobody's puppet. I'd outlined a project for an alternative Europe. And what then transpired was I was excluded. Oh, no, he, he sent me on a second visit to Paris to follow through with some of the key economic advisors, including Olivier Vols, who had warned that if there were a widened Europe, it would become a free trade area. But I was excluded from the tour of capitals. What George Brown and, and Harold made a tour of the European capitals. 
in which Private Eye has the most brilliant cover, which some of you might recollect if I describe it. It was de Gaulle coming down, it was in the Tiamon uh, Palace. De Gaulle coming down the stairs, tall, of course. Uh, Harold, much smaller, a step lower. And George Brown, with his eyes half closed, uh, <laughs> slipping on the stairs. And the balloon, uh, the private eye cover, was Harold saying to de Gaulle, George est un peu fatigué, what <laughs> What happened, I, I only much later saw the official transcripts. Wilson made no effort whatsoever to follow through on the agenda to which de Gaulle had said yes. And even the Foreign Office had caught up the week before and was sending messages through to London saying, you've got to specify the project. So he knew if he did not specify the project, he would fail. He'd taken the superficial way out. By applying, he avoided a resignation of Roy Jenkins, Michael Stewart, uh, and some others. By failing, he appeased the left that didn't want to apply. But this was virtually the only chance we were going to have of actually getting an enlargement of the community which denied supranationalism and offset neoliberalism. And that substantially influenced me when I decided to resign. About ten minutes to it. Yeah, okay. Well, a, a touch on the single European Act. I met Jacques Delors on a committee of the Commission in 1975. Uh, the Commission at that time, probably afterwards, was always ending any contract with advisors with uh, and to advocate closer economic union. I said, I'm, I'm not taking part in any group advocates ever closer economic union. It depends on what kind of got that union. Well, anyway, they, they, it appears that they wanted me because I succeeded in that being eliminated. And besides, they said, no, but then it's going to be a very small committee and there's going to be this very interesting chap called Jacques Delors, who, like you, was advising a prime minister and resigned. He was advising Chabon Delmas on social affairs. Delors and I hit it off. And uh, we, <laughs> we had to report on structural factors in inflation. Does it have any resonance with certain terms that are still familiar now, like structural adjustment, denial of a European social model? Well, they made a mistake in putting us both on this committee. Uh, because Delors' reaction, I mean, he heard everybody else, he was very cautious initially, and he said, uh, I think I can only remember it in French, but uh, he said, L'inflation n'a rien à faire avec des syndicats de pouvoir syndical. L'inflation est symptôme du désordre capitaliste. <laughs> so I thought, great! <laughs> <laughs> I could really work with this man. <laughs> and we uh, then brought out a report, which was really one of the first statements of economic, case for economic and social cohesion. The high level officials in the commission didn't catch up with it at first. When they suddenly realized what it had said, they canceled the press conference, and they tried to reclaim all the copies of it that had been distributed inside the commission, and then pulped them. So, of course, they banged the report. This was not just somewhat unintelligent, since the report included the man who later was to be the most influential uh, president of the commission in its history, but it guaranteed attention. You know, I mean, there are so many goddamn reports come out of the commission, and their authors are really glad if they get three lines mentioned in their local newspaper. This report was published three times over in three European papers. And Agenor published it again as the Maldag report, that was the chair of the committee, banned. So, Delors and I, uh, in particular, said, well, we can't stop here. And there was uh, 
a commission official, a social democrat, called Hans Beck, who found us money to meet, to, to widen the network, because the banning of the Maldaga report had, a, had an impact in Greece and in Spain and in Portugal. Greece had just come out of, they'd all just come out of dictatorship. And the left in these countries wanted to, to know and talk further with and advance this alternative social agenda for Europe. So Hans Beck found us this money in a completely anonymous uh, budget for discussing, no doubt, closer, ever, ever closer union uh, in Europe. And we met uh, twice a year. And we expanded to include some representatives, mainly younger generation, as even I then was, uh, of every socialist party in Europe. Then we had a launch conference in Paris. Uh, well, before that, we had, I know, I've only got another five minutes. I think we're going to stay with this and the single European Act. Andreas Papandreou heard about it. And uh, he, my wife, my then wife, was uh, her more youthful experiences, let's put it this way, had been in Greece. She was in love with Greece. She spoke Greek. There was only one place we were going to have a holiday, is Greece. Papandreou and we were there and wanted to meet up. And he said, he said to me, first time we met, he said, I understand you invented a new Greek economics. Well, I was a bit taken aback, actually, and couldn't quite see what you meant. He said, meso-economics. Meso is Greek. And I said, oh yes, meso-economics, yes. Yes, quite so, yes, very good. He said, I need your advice. I want PASOK to join the Outer Crisis, we called it by then, Outer Crisis Project. Um, I said, that, that's, and I need your advice also on domestic economic policy, regional policy, for example. I said, look, Andreas, you're a bright guy. You know, you're a bright man. I mean, you've been chair of the Department of Economics at Berkeley. Surely you don't need help from me. And he said, yeah, but you know, I was an econometrician. Uh, I know nothing about European policies or what's really happening in Europe now. And then we had, uh, uh, I think I'll just make two, two main points on him and then the law and, and stop. He said, he set up a meeting with some of the Outer Crisis team, including Mitterrand's economic advisor, who was not Jacques Attali, who never left the LEC. Uh, and in, to prepare the first Greek European Council, was, his main meeting was going to be in December 83. And so when he turned up for the meeting, I met him then several times. Uh, there was Semitis, Laliotis, Genimatas, uh, the, the key Greek ministers. Semitis was later to be prime minister for 18 years. Um, so he turned up and he said, right, Stuart, I want you to chair the meeting. So I said, fine. Uh, he said, and uh, I'm going back to the Maximo, the Greek number 10. I wish I could stay, but I'll be back before lunch. I want you to answer two questions then. One, what's wrong with this common market? Two, what should we do about it? So uh, he came back and he said, okay, Stuart, so what's wrong with this common market? So I said, da 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 you know, the whole neoliberal case is, is wrong. We need to replicate the pop, what Tim Burton called the positive integration rather than negative integration uh, of the Spark Report, etc., etc. And I stopped and he said, okay, that's fine, and what should we do? So I said, we have to recover the imbalance, emerging imbalance between public and private economic power. We have to recover the European economy through redistribution. We have to uh, have positive policies, etc., etc. That took about another two minutes. He said, fine. So how do I say it to the Greek people and to Europe in three words? So everybody felt about laughing. I mean, you know, <laughs> these are quite, 
quite complex arguments. How do you say it in three words? And then, when laughing at the impossibility, I said, well, wait a minute. What do we say when we want to show we're fundamentally dissatisfied with the IMF and the World Bank? We say we want a new Bretton Woods. What was the founding treaty of the common market? It was Messina. You must call for a new Messina conference. I'm cutting out some of the other stuff, which is, I, I did add, uh, it may not be understood by the dustman father of one of my MA students in Sussex, but it will be understood by bureaucrats. And he called for it, Mitterrand endorsed it the following June at the next European Council, the European Council endorsed it, and that was the basis for what emerged as the Single European Act, uh, which committed the Union, though Angela Merkel is unaware of this, to both an internal market and economic and social cohesion. Okay, so would you want up that? I think we should give people a chance to ask some stuff, Stuart, because I think you could go on. So, thank you for that. And um, we'll pause now and just see if there are aspects of what Stuart said or anything else you'd like to hear him wrap up. Um, <laughs> um, I had a question. Uh, it pertains to the last part for Andreas Papandreou, um, because there are a lot of um, there is a lot of talk in Greece right now about how probably Papandreou ruined the country and is responsible for the current situation that the country is in. Uh, I was wondering what your personal impression of him was, and uh, kind of like an insider look into how he was. That's far too glib. It's far too glib. It's like new democracy saying in election after election, we are the party of Europe. Papandreou managed to change Europe at, at that stage. And the law then followed through when he was commissioner with a full employment white paper uh, and to issue bonds to offset the deflationary effects of the Maastricht debt and deficit criteria the law is being blamed now for being a complete idealist, going for a single currency, not recognizing the problems. He recognized them very well. And Papandreou was blocked. Um, yeah, he was, he was both a brilliant econometrician and a very Greek politician. But he had to bring, he, had, he, had, he was trying to bring Greece into a post-traditional era. He said to me also at one of the dinners we had, you know, when, when I had dinner with Andreas, uh, the table stretched from about here to the end of the room, and there were an you know, outside restaurant, there were everyone around. He said, to, one of the other things I was pushing at the same time with Ken Coates um, was European nuclear disarmament. CND was like telling the world you wanted to get off. European nuclear disarmament as a nuclear weapons free zone or free of crews um, was a serious proposition. And Andreas said to me, he said, you know I'm committed to leaving the common market and to leaving NATO. I said, of course. He said, you realize I can't do either. I said, of course. He said, but I can offer an alternative agenda through the Outer Crisis Project with you and the law and through European nuclear disarmament. As I take him very, and he got me in to draft, for example, regional legislation. The problems he was up against were simply immense. He said, Stuart, um, I said, look, you should have, you should have regional development agencies. Every mayor should have an advisor on how to apply the structural funds, which they weren't properly doing. He said, this is brilliant, but I don't have the personnel. I don't, my civil servants can't do this. I said, you do have the personnel. He said, so where are they? I said, they're all MA, MPhil, or DPhil uh, students in London. Uh, and you should launch MA and MPhil programs relating to regional development theory and policies and European funds and how these uh, students succeed or not in uh, realizing these and human investment-based projects uh, at a local level, which he did. And he got me into the Ministry of Coordination to actually draft what came out as programmatic, are you agree? No, yes. 
what came out as problematic is in for Niels. Uh, he was very open-minded, far more. I'm, he, was, he was brilliant. Whether or not he felt he had to do that to maintain sport, bear in mind, pass up, there never previously been a socialist, well, you will realize, there never previously been a socialist government in Greece. There was also, you know, he lived through two military coups. Well, under Mitsotakis, and yeah. then again under Papadopoulos. There was a degree to which he had to buy consent. I, he did not say this to me, but my judgment is there was a degree to which he had to buy consent simply to get consent for democracy. And question. Uh, when I resigned from number 10, I never thought I'd be advising another government. It wasn't my aim. Or, an, or the Labour Party within three, four, four years' time. Uh, I just wanted, uh, you know, when I went to resign and he said, uh, I got, I'm going to make, make a, I don't want to say an offer you can't afford to refuse, but he probably thought it, it was. I said, I used to be head of a policy unit, so young. I said, listen, Harold, your heart's in the right place. But we're constantly set back. We have no strategy. Yes? You can accommodate a strategy according to time and circumstance. But we have no strategy, whatever. We regard it as a success if we actually manage to defeat a proposal from two or three departments to deny every principle in Labour's program. And he said, well, you can do the rethinking from here. And I said, of course, I, I may have made the wrong decision. But I said, I, the rethinking can't be done from in here. When people asked me why I was resigning, I said, yeah, you know, it's number 10. And uh, I've got a Reynolds on the wall, and I'm overlooking 10 Downing Street. But it's a gilded cage. And uh, I really felt I had to get out, and I just wanted to wanted to set things out, especially concerning strategy, in an already multinational era. I had no idea I'd be coming back. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, really, really fascinating stories. Um, yesterday, on the panel I was chairing, it's quite obvious your exasperation with some of those closely associated with new Labour. Yeah. Um, if there is hope within the Labour Party, as far as you're concerned, where does it where does it reside, or perhaps within social democracy more generally, uh, where does it reside today? I think there's more hope with Ed Miliband than there would have been with David. Uh, I never met Ed. Of course, I know who he is, and I know he knows who I am. And I've been briefing his head of staff and chief economic advisor and, and whatever on the case for European recovery financed by bonds. And that's something that I will uh, distinct tomorrow morning. It, I should not have more than seven minutes or whatever to, to talk about this. But we must distinguish bonds for mutualization of debt from bonds for recovery, which were the bonds I recommended to the law to offset the deflationary effects of Maastricht. And one of the things I really want to get, the, the other thing is I really do want to see Ed face to face because it always makes a difference. Seven minutes is enough, running to 10. Uh, I want him to really be able to think these alternatives. Now, I managed to, one of the important things when 
I propose bonds to the law. And he put them in his 1993 white paper, uh, which he regarded as the summit of his achievement in his presidency. Um, one of the points I made, which was my, my report to him, was published very quickly by Ken Coates uh, at Russell Press, within six weeks or so. So it came out just before the Law's White Paper. And somebody from the European Investment Bank rang me. He was the director called Tom Barrett. And this is directly relevant to both what Labour might do and Europe, European social democracy might do. So he said, Stuart, uh, of course we've seen the President's uh, white paper. And we've also seen your report to him. And although he recommends union bonds, he doesn't make the analogy that you do with the US, that US Treasury bonds don't count on the debt of California or Delaware. And that you're arguing that European bonds need not count on national debt. <coughs> And I said, uh, no, well, yes. And then he said, but perhaps the president is not aware, and maybe you are not aware, that of the present member states, which was then, what, 12, coming up 15, only two come borrowing from us on the, against national debt. And he told me which they were. They were the UK and the Netherlands. Well, this was, this was gold dust. I would never have learned that. You know, you'll, nev you'll never find that on the website of the EIB. Later, I found there were finance ministers that didn't know. Because central bank governors knew, but they're not likely to say to an incoming government, oh, by the way, finance minister, do you know any anything we borrow from the European Investment Bank doesn't count on national debt? <laughs> I mean, that really would be letting the brakes off. Uh, and then I worked with Antonio Guterres for several years when he was Prime Minister of Portugal. Guterres was absolutely brilliant and more effective at getting things through the European Council than the law had been. And he said, okay, what is needed? If your case is that, cohesion will never be financed by fiscal transfers. But if you shift national borrowing to European borrowing and off national debt, then you can promote cohesion, especially if more of that investment is in peripheral Europe rather than Central Europe. So I said, so he proposed, he said, well, what, what's needed? I said, the original design for the European Investment Bank is intelligent. It will fund projects of general European interest. But we must give it a cohesion remit, he said, such as, I said, to invest in health, education, urban renewal, the environment, small and medium firms, uh, new high-tech startups. So he took that. And the great thing about Guterres, which is underestimated, his name is not, not really known. He went into a European Council, which then was of 15, in a minority of one, and argued the case. He built the case. And then we were coming to the next European Council. And every, uh, he said, how do I do this? Uh, 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 well, I don't want to put it this, this bluntly. He said, he said, European, no, this will do. <laughs> Picking and choosing from memory. Um, he said, Stuart, the European Council is not a seminar. I, you know, I mean, I can't, I, I can't educate these people. And I said, you don't need to educate them. You just say, I propose, you know, one, line, one half line proposal, in terms of reference, the European Investment Bank should be extended to investment in health, education, urban renewal, and the environment. I said, which Prime Minister is going to put up his hand and say, I'm against investment in health, urban renewal, the environment, etc., etc. He did it. And there was only one Prime Minister. Actually, he was a Chancellor, uh, who said no, which was Helmut Kohl. So, 
come, I wasn't I wasn't at the the summit, uh, but I got a direct report from his uh, international advisor. So Kohl comes out of the summit, and the press says, Chancellor, why are you opposed? And Kohl said, the German taxpayer has paid enough. So I met with Guterres and his international advisor next time, in, very soon afterwards in Lisbon, because he was also chair of the International Committee of the Socialist International. And he said, well, what are we going to do about Kohl? And I said, well, it's quite clear he doesn't know what a bond is. The bond is not paid for by a German taxpayer. And uh, so he said, well, how do we get around it? And his advisor, who was called José de Freitas Ferraz, was wonderful. You know, if you're, if you're anywhere near a prime minister, the jealousy that that generates among permanent officials can be devastating, crippling. José de Freitas Ferraz used to ring me up six weeks before every European Council and say, Stuart, such and such is coming up, you've got the ideas. Well, I was full of ideas, because these were the ideas I put to the law, but he'd failed to implement, he'd failed to convince at the time. So, Felix Ferraz said, well, I was at OECD some time ago with Cole's economic advisor, Joseph Bitterly. Um, perhaps we should write a memo for the Chancellor. Well, I have some German, but I don't pretend how good my German is, I wouldn't draft something in German for Cole, but I, I drafted in English, and I said, Dear Chancellor, Amsterdam European Council is coming up. Undoubtedly, yet again, Prime Minister Guterres will be pro proposing an extension of European investment bank bonds to finance investment in health, education, urban renewal, etc., etc. However, as you may have underestimated, this will be very useful for German pension funds because, of course, bonds are not funded, financed by German taxpayers, but pension funds are looking for investment outlets and this could be our contribution to a social Europe. So, Amsterdam European Council came up. This was proposed, but there was a new young Prime Minister uh, who liked to be, had photo shoots on bicycles uh, who just been elected in Britain, Tony Blair. And Cole said yes. And Blair said, no, no, I'm opposed to any new European financial instruments. And uh, argued against. So at the end of the European Council, it was Freitas Ferras told me of this encounter. Guterres, who is very self-controlled, was clearly very angry. We have been working on this for about three years, through six European councils. So he came up. Tony came. They, they Tony each other, of course. You know, Antonio, Tony, etc., etc. So Blair comes up to Antonio and says, "Antonio, I mean, th this bond thing. Actually, it's really interesting. It sounds a very good idea." So Guterres said, then why did you oppose it? Now Blair was holding the papers, some papers in his hands, and he said, well, I've been briefed to oppose any new financial instruments, and I thought I ought to stick to my brief. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the Prime Minister? Who had briefed him? Who had briefed him, of course, was Gordon Brown. You're back to your key points from the start, Stuart, and I'm going to stop it there, I think, because they're great stories and they could go on and the bar and dinner beckons, so they can go on. We've been in this room close on 10 hours. Now. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, allow, allow, allow me to link to the question. Right. <laughs> These, uh, <laughs> no, not an answer, I mean, but the link to <laughs> Recovery bonds need to be distinguished from mutualization of debt. Recovery bonds can be issued by the European Investment Fund. They need not count on national debt. The fund itself admitted that to the Economic and Social Committee recently. They can attract global surpluses. They don't even need surplus transfers within Europe. And they don't need, the, the final point, they don't need any treaty revision. They don't need any revision of statutes. 
They don't need unanimity. They don't need Germany. They can be introduced. You couldn't mutualize debt by enhanced cooperation without Germany. But you can issue recovery bonds without Germany. And enhanced cooperation was a footnote trivia uh, until Germany and Austria proposed it for a financial transaction tax. Now it's on the agenda. It needs 11 or more member states. And uh, it needs two in particular to move. Italy, with whom I'm in dialogue through a matter with Letta and Sacomani, the finance minister, but also François Hollande. But if Italy moves, François Hollande also has got his back to the wall vis-a-vis -vis his party. Everyone is bitterly disappointed with him. Then I think he also would move. In which case, as the head of the German Greens, a head, they always have co-chairs, uh, said to me in the European Parliament recently, he said, enhanced cooperation, you'll never get Merkel to agree. I said, if she, no, no. Uh, bonds for recovery, you'll never get Merkel to agree. I said, but if she knows that a procedure could be introduced by enhanced cooperation on which you would be outvoted, then she may agree. The last thing she wants to be is minority. And he hit me on the arm and he said, that is serious politics. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Stuart.